Look. So in this video, we're going to talk about Euripides' play Alcestis. Alcestis is an interesting play because it's not exactly a tragedy, but it's also not a comedy per se. It's, it's a kind of dark comedy, I guess, because the basic sort of plot line goes from things are not necessarily fantastic to things are really bad, to a happy ending, which is the basic arc of comedy. But the happy ending at the end of this play is also not really that happy. Like, it is, it's something that Euripides clearly wants us to be skeptical of. So, uh, uh, there's some, a lot of interesting stuff going on here. Um, and to sort of start the the plot overview, I actually want to start with the, the prologue from Apollo, um, because he sort of explains the background and the lead up to the events of the play, which I'll then talk you through in more detail. He says, Ah, house of Admetus, where I was a lowly servant once. Yes, I, a god, and all because Zeus slew my son Asclepius hurled lightning through his heart, and I in my rage slaughtered his one-eyed giants, the cyclopses who forge his thunderbolts. For my punishment my father made me flunky to a mortal man, so here I came, my host's cattleman and staunch supporter of his house until this day. An upright man myself, I found an upright man. And by tricking the fates I saved him from his time of death. Those ladies made this bargain with me. We'll let it meet us off his dying for now, if he'll exchange one body for another down below. Well, he importuned and canvassed all, uh, all his near and dear, including father and old gray-haired mother, and found none, and found absolutely no one to give up the light for him and die. No one, that is, except his wife. She's limp in his arms this moment in the house, gasping out her last. Today's the day she has to die and flit from life, but I've come outside the house, those friend these friendly halls. I don't want death's contagion smeared all over me in there. He sees death emerge, drably and mournfully dressed with a drawn sword. Ah, no less than death himself, the great undertaker, itching to take her down to the house of Hades. Right on time, too. He's been watching for this day, the day she dies. So, as Apollo says here, the plot of this play is basically driven by uh, the fact that Admetus has been given a chance to cheat death, provided that someone is willing to die on his behalf. The only person willing to do this is his wife, Alcestis. Um, and she she's young, she's pretty, she's a mother, she's great queen, whatever it is. So she's not necessarily an ideal person to die. Like, she's a person that, generally speaking, uh, society would want to keep alive. But she agrees to sacrifice herself for her husband on sort of the premise that his life is more worthy than hers and that he's a good man and whatever it is, as, as Apollo says here. He's a, he's a just man. Much of the first half of the play is taken up with Alcestis dying and people basically lamenting, um, including Admetus, who laments extensively. Um, and he says repeatedly and extensively, Oh, I wish I could die in your place. Which is, of course, super ironic because she is, in fact, literally dying in his place. Like, he is the one who's supposed to be dying and she has taken that. And so for him to repeatedly say, oh, I wish I could die instead of you, this is one of the ironies of the play that Euripides really, really highlights. Like he, eventually he hammers this point that Admetus is hypocritical about this. Um, so this goes on for a while. Alcestis dies. Everyone is sad. Heracles shows up. Heracles and Admetus are friends. Heracles shows up um, to to come and stay in uh, um, Admetus' house. Um, 
And this is actually a really important point because this raises significant questions about the value of hospitality. And I'm going to come back to that. Um, because what Admetus does is basically lies to Heracles and says, oh, yes, we're in mourning, but it's for like a distant friend. So you should still go in, go to the other room, have a feast, get drunk, whatever it is. Avail yourself of my hospitality. So Heracles is taken in by this lie um, that it's a distant relative. So he goes in, he starts partying. Um, Edmetus' father shows up for the funeral, and this is a really significant portion of the text. Um, because Edmetus not entirely justifiably blames his parents for Alcestis uh, dying because both of them, both his mother and his father, had refused to die in his place and so that was why uh, Alcestis agreed. Um, Admetus, when when uh, when his father Fares comes, uh, Admetus is not particularly welcoming or forgiving of the fact that fairies chose not to die in his place. Um, he says, You showed your true self when it came to the trial. I count myself no son of yours, oh you are, oh, you are a master coward. Senile, on the very fringe of life, yet lacking the heart, oh no, the guts to lay down your life for your son. You let this woman do it, outsider to your blood. And then he later goes on, and he becomes even less filial uh, as he goes on. He says, um, Nor can you say it was because I disrespected your gray hairs that I abandoned, that you abandoned me to die. I always honored you. I made a point of it. This is the thanks I get from you and my mother. We'll lose no time. Spawn some offspring to pamper your old age. Deck you out and wind your shroud when you are dead. For I shan't lift a hand to bury you. And, as we know from, uh, for instance, a play like Sophocles' Antigone, leaving someone unburied was a big sin for the Greeks. It was a, a terrible thing to do. And for a child, particularly, to refuse their parents, this was a, a major, major thing. Like, this is a, this is a huge taboo that Admetus is violating because he blames his parents for not accepting the death that Alcestis took. But fairies, quite rightly, points out, you struggled without a blush to hang on to life, and now you only live because you killed this woman and went beyond your span. Yet I'm the coward, you say. You, you prince of cowards, shown up by a woman who died for you, oh fine young man. So smart you found a way to live forever if you can wheedle the current wife to die instead. But don't revile your friends if they won't do the same. So keep your mouth shut, coward, and remember, if you love your life, so does everybody else. If you speak ill of us, you'll hear ill of you and true. So fairies very accurately points out the fact that his son, Admetus, has done exactly the same thing that Admetus charges fairies with having done. This is a this is a situation in which Admetus has caused the death of his wife more directly than fairies and Admetus' mom have, and yet Admetus is blaming them. He's criticizing them for that thing. And Euripides is not letting us ignore this. Euripides is making this very, very overt to call our attention to the hypocrisy of Admetus, to call our attention to how little he is worthy of the sacrifice that Alcestis makes for him. And that becomes really, really important at the end. And I'm 
I'm going to get to the end uh, in just a bit. But before I do that, I want to talk about this uh, theme of hospitality, because this is something that's really, really significant in Greek literature and Greek drama. Uh, this is, for instance, a big, big theme in Homer's The Odyssey, where Odysseus is continually sort of navigating rules of hospitality and things like this. So, when Heracles first shows up, Admetus is in mourning, and, and Heracles says, I mean to propose myself as guest in some other house. Admetus refuses to let him do this. He insists that Heracles stay at his house and enjoy his hospitality. Um, and when the leader of the chorus says, what are you doing, Admetus? Overwhelmed by catastrophe and you think of entertaining? Are you out of your senses? Admetus says, you mean you'd think, you'd think much more of me if I turned him out? Expelled a guest from house and town? Surely not. My being unfriendly would do nothing to reduce my woes. It would simply add the evil of inhospitality, and my house would get the name of unfriendly hall. I find this fellow the best of hosts whenever I visit the thirsty land of Argos. So, this is the thing here, is Admetus brings Heracles into his home, even though he, he tells his servants, take him in the back room where he can't see any of the funeral stuff, and no one tell him that El it's Alcestis who's died. Um, he brings Heracles into his home out of an ethical obligation to provide hospitality to the stranger. So, Heracles is in the back room, partying, getting drunk, wearing leaves in his hair and all this stuff. And Admetus's servant, Admetus's butler, is basically like, this fucking guy. Like, we're out here mourning the loss of our beloved queen, and he's back here getting drunk and singing and dancing and doing whatever he whatever he's doing. Um, and Heracles, who, to be fair, is not usually all that bright in uh, Greek tragedy and in a lot of Greek literature, Heracles actually picks up on this. And he's like, mm, you, butler, you are you have a vinegary face. He actually uses the phrase vinegary face, which is a great, great phrase, I think. Um and so Heracles gets out of the butler the information that Alcestis is the one who has died. And so what Heracles says is, I must go at once and save this lately dead, restore Alcestis to this home of hers, and make Admetus some return. I'll go and hunt out death, that gloom-draped king of corpses, and I think I'll find him knocking back libations near the tomb. I'll leap out from an ambush, grab him, weld my arms around him, and no matter how he heaves and strains, no man alive shall prize me from my, shall prize him from my bone-crushing vice, until he's handed back this woman. But if by chance my quarry balks me, don't come to, doesn't come to get his bait of blood and porridge, I'll take myself below to the sun-starved halls of Persephone and Pluto and do my asking there. I'm sure I shall fetch Alcestis up and put her in the arms of my most generous host who made me at home and did not turn me out, though he was struck to the heart with grief. Yes, hid his feelings, heroic man, and did me honor. Is there anyone in Thessaly more hospitable than he, anyone in Greece? Never let him say that such nobility was answered by a lack of generosity. So Heracles, in recompense for Admetus offering hospitality, determines that he is going to go fight death for the soul of Alcestis, basically. And he's going to bring her back from the dead, which he does. Uh, it goes exactly according to plan, at least from what Heracles recounts. He shows up at the tomb, uh, sees Death, who's just sort of chilling there. Heracles grabs him and basically squeezes him until Death agrees to let Alcestis come back. Now, the ending of the play is really, really interesting because when Heracles shows up, um, the stage directions, and this is 
this is an editorial stage direction from our translator Paul Roche. This is not something in uh, the original Greek uh, manuscripts. But it says, Enter Heracles leading a woman heavily veiled. So Heracles basically shows up with Alcestis in disguise. And it gets interesting here because he starts by saying, one should be candid with a friend, Admetus, not keep grudges smoldering within. So basically, the first thing Heracles says is, you should tell your friend the truth, Admetus. Then Heracles proceeds to lie about who this woman is. Basically, he tells Admetus, yeah, I won this woman in a contest of strength, and I want you to hold on to her for me. Basically, like, keep her in your house until I get back from one of my 12 labors that I've got to go do. And Admetus is like, yeah, I don't really want this woman. I don't have anywhere for her to stay. If I put her in the servants' quarters with my male servants, they'll try and have sex with her. If I put her in my dead wife's bed, people are going to be like, hey, that's a little weird that you're keeping this sexy young woman in your dead wife's bed after you were like, oh, I'll never marry again or have sex with another woman. So Admetus is not particularly chuffed with this plan, but Heracles is basically like, hey man, if you don't take this woman, then I will hate you forever. And Admetus is like, all right, I really don't want to, but you're a good friend. I, I, you know, I'll do you a solid on this. Um, and then Admetus is like, yeah, I, I'm just, I'm really not happy with this, especially since she's kind of got the same, you know, build as my dead wife. So this is all making me a bit uncomfortable. And then Heracles is basically like, hey, why don't you hold her hand? And Ad Admetus is like, I don't really want to. And Heracles is like, yeah, no, just, just, just hold her hand. And then Heracles takes off her veil and he's like, oh, surprise! It's Alcestis. I got her back from the dead. I wrestled him and now she's back. And Admetus is like, oh, this is the greatest thing that's ever happened. Oh, why isn't she talking? And Heracles is like, she can't talk to you for three days because she needs to purge the underworld's claim on her. So, Admetus, who, despite Apollo telling us that he was this great, just guy, is really kind of a dick. Like, lets his wife die for him, and then blames his parents for not choosing to die for him, while being very reluctant to accept the responsibility that he set up his wife's own death, um, is now getting her back. And we get and, 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 and Alcestis herself is denied the opportunity to let us know what she thinks about this at the end of the play. Like, I... Like, if... If I were... If I, if I died in the place of my significant other, and then I was brought back to life... I don't know that I would necessarily be all that interested in spending the rest of my second life with that person, knowing that they had willingly let me die in their place. Like, it, so, and I think that's one of the things that Euripides is trying to get here is that is raising these serious questions. 